welcome to 2024. It's good to be with you. For those of you that are first timers, let me let me introduce myself. My name is Kay Godfrey. I'm a period historian of the life of the Prophet Joseph Smith. And I'm honored that uh, Latter-day Media has asked me again to, uh, to be a part of podcasts for this year as we collectively study the Book of Mormon. I've uh, been privileged this last three years to produce many podcasts on our courses of study. We did 35 podcasts or more on the history of the church in conjunction with the Doctrine and Covenants, and then did a series of podcasts on the Torah as we discussed the Old Testament, and just concluded 25 plus podcasts on the New Testament. So it's a, it's a privilege to be with you and discuss with you and to leave with you some thoughts relative to this year's Come Follow Me material, uh, the Book of Mormon. I'm going to take a little different approach than I've done in the past when I've done podcasts uh, for this year. I'm going to identify in our reading assignments each week some particular concept or idea that I would like to highlight, and that's what I'll be presenting to you during the course of podcasts. My podcasts will cover a two-week period of time. During the course of a month, you have an opportunity to sit and discuss with others in your Gospel Doctrine class uh, the Book of Mormon twice. And so my my podcast will cover a two-week period of time to keep us on top of our discussion opportunities. I uh, may or may not use PowerPoints. I've used PowerPoints over the last three years to help emphasize certain aspects of what I'm trying to discuss, but perhaps this will be more of an open field, an open opportunity to discuss some things. So there'll be PowerPoint presentations, but perhaps not quite as many. And the length of the podcast also may vary. Typically, my podcast lasts a half an hour. Um, there'll be something similar to that, 20 minutes to 30 minutes, I, I feel. Because I want to provide an opportunity for a little bit of feedback, a little Q&A opportunity at the conclusion of podcasts. So if you have questions about anything I've discussed over the last three years and would like me to address or answer those questions, if you'll send those questions in, they'll get to me. And at the conclusion of podcasts, we'll spend a few minutes and, and, and answer the questions that you might have. So we'll go ahead and begin with, uh, with our Come Follow Me material as we study the Book of Mormon. I have themed this year's podcast uh, to convince all people that Jesus is the Christ. And frankly, that is the purpose of the Book of Mormon, to convince all people that Jesus is the Christ. So that's going to be our theme. So hopefully everything we discuss over the course of 2024 will emphasize that aspect of the gospel, a willingness to, to, uh, to read the Book of Mormon and to have a better, a better understanding of our Savior. So, beginning with week one, uh, our material uh, for the first week of January is to uh, discuss the title page of the Book of Mormon and the witness testimonies. Uh, the title page of the Book of Mormon was the last page that was added to the record by Moroni uh, prior to burying the plates. And it was written by Moroni, the title page itself. It's kind of fascinating. The prophet Joseph Smith said that the title page of the Book of Mormon is a translation taken from the very last leaf on the left-hand side. And that's, that's kind of interesting. I, I speak Hebrew and read some Hebrew. And when you read a text that's in Hebrew, you read instead of from the left to the right, the right to the left, which means you're last page of a, of a book would probably be on the left-hand side, as the Prophet Joseph is talking a little bit about. The title page was translated in May of 1829 by Joseph, and it's in the handwriting of, of course, his scribe, Oliver Cowdery. Unfortunately, the original manuscript of the Book of Mormon and its title page, of course, were lost uh, when they were put in the cornerstone of the Nauvoo House. They were put in that box that you see in the bottom right corner, buried where that square is in the grass. Unfortunately, over the years, water and mold entered the box and destroyed about two-thirds of the original transcript of the, uh, of the Book of Mormon that was, that was there, including the title page. 
Uh, fortunately, however, in 2005, a copy of the title page, as it appeared in its original form, was found in the Library of Congress. On the 11th of June of 1829, Joseph recorded an application in the federal court in the Northern District of New York. He was attempting to secure a copyright for the Book of Mormon. The application that he was filling out required a description of the Book of Mormon. Joseph decided to use the title page as the description of the Book of Mormon. It was handwritten and is the earliest printed page from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so we have literally the title page, courtesy of the Library of Congress. Let's take a minute now and take a look at the, uh, the three witnesses, the, the testimonies that are found. One of the most important events that took place at the Peter Whitmer Farm in Fayette, New York in 1829 was the... Uh, the opportunity that three men had to uh, to witness the the plates and to uh, to leave their testimonies for us um, oliver cowdery and martin harris and david whitmer had been reading from second nephi 27 12 which reads wherefore at that day when the book shall be delivered unto the man of whom i have spoken that would be joseph smith the book shall be hid from the eyes of the world that the eyes of none shall behold it save it be that three witnesses shall behold it by the power of god besides him to whom the book shall be delivered and they shall testify to the truth of the book and the things therein well, in David Whitmer's diary, he states that the important fulfillment of this scripture took place 40 rods from the Whitmer cabin. Now, that's a measurement we don't use too often today. A rod equals 15 and a half feet. So 40 rods is going to be about 660 feet from the cabin. Well, today, that would be in cornfields that surround the cabin. But back in 1829, it was a wooded forest. So the question I want to pose is, is what did the three witnesses experience that day and what did they see? And I want to begin by discussing Doctrine and Covenants section 17 verses 1 through 3. We learn from this section the potential opportunities of what would transpire with that marvelous event. Now I've highlighted here um, what it, I think is important for us to, to look at. In the header of De Doctrine and Covenants section 17, it says, Revelations given through Joseph Smith the prophet to Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, and Martin Harris at Fayette, New York in June of 1829, prior to their viewing the engraved plates that contained the Book of Mormon record. And then if you drop down a little bit, it says, The prophet inquired of the Lord, and this revelation was given in answer through the Urim and Thummim. And looking at verse 1, it's kind of fascinating. It says to these three brethren, You shall have a view of the plates, and also of the breastplate, the sword of Laban, the Urim and Thummim which were given to the brother of Jared upon the mount when he talked with the Lord face to face, and the marvelous directors, which were given to Lehi while in the wilderness on the borders of the Red Sea. And then how are they going to see all this stuff? In verse 2 it says, And it is by your faith that you shall obtain a view of them. So this is quite a thing here. Lots of artifacts. Lots of opportunity here. So, the question I pose is, did they see the breastplate? Did they see the sword of Laban? Did they see the Urim and Thummim? Did they see the marvelous director? Well, let's take a look at their testimony and see what it reflects that they actually saw. So, reading right from the testimony of the three witnesses, it says, Be it known unto all nations, kindreds, tongue, and people, unto whom this work shall come, that we, through the grace of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, have seen the plates which contain this record, which is a record of the people of Nephi and also of the Lamanites, their brethren, and also of the people of Jared, who came from the tower which hath been spoken. And we also know that they have been translated by the gift and power of God, for his voice hath declared it unto us, 
Wherefore, we know of a surety that the work is true. And we also testify that we have seen the engravings which are upon the plates, and they have been shown unto us by the power of God and not of man. And we declare with words of soberness that an angel of God came down from heaven, and he brought and laid before our eyes that we beheld and saw the plates and the engravings thereon. And we know it is by the grace of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ Christ, that we beheld the record that these things are true, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Nevertheless, the voice of the Lord commanded us that we should bear record of it. Wherefore, to be obedient unto the commandment of God, we bear record of these things, and we know that if we are faithful in Christ, we shall rid our garments of the blood of all men, and be found spotless before the judgment seat of Christ, and shall dwell with him eternally in the heavens. And the honor be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, which is one God. Amen. Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, and Martin Harris. That's really kind of interesting. Their testimonies reflect that they saw the plates, they saw the engravings, they heard the voice of an angel, and they saw an angel. Did they see these other things? It doesn't reflect in their testimony that they had that opportunity. Perhaps it wasn't important to talk in their testimony about the other artifacts. Perhaps they were to remain focused on the thing that mattered the most, and that was their opportunity to see the plates, the engravings, and the angel. Kind of fascinating. Well, the earliest existent copy of the testimony of the three witnesses is written again in Oliver Cowdery's handwriting. Oliver wrote many times about his encounter with the angels. One well-known example is a letter written to by Oliver to W. W. Phelps. Uh, his part of his letter says, uh, These were days never forgotten, to sit under the sound of a voice dictated by the inspiration of heaven, awakened the uttermost gratitude of this bosom. Day after day I continued uninterrupted to write from his mouth as he translated the Book of Mormon. Well, according to uh, Hiram Page, as Oliver was on his deathbed, he reaffirmed his testimony of the Book of Mormon. And Elizabeth Ann Whitmer Cowdery, Oliver's wife, said, My husband, Oliver Cowdery, bore his testimony to the truth and divine origin of the Book of Mormon as one of the three witnesses. In 1876, David Whitmer wrote a lengthy letter to a man named Mark Forscutt. And in that letter, it included the following. Oliver Cowdery lived in Richmond, Missouri, some 40 miles from here at the time of his death. I went to see him and was with him for some days previous to his demise. I have never heard him deny the truth of his testimony or the Book of Mormon under any circumstances whatsoever. Neither do I believe that he would have denied at the peril of his life. So firm was he that he could not be made to deny what he had affirmed to be a divine revelation from God. Okay, the scriptures tell us in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So we've talked about Oliver Cowdery. So David Whitmer. David Whitmer never reconciled his feelings about the church or with Joseph Smith to regain his membership. However, on March 19, 1881, seven years before his death, David wanted to set the record straight. And so he published an affidavit in the local newspaper relative to his feelings about his witness experience. Part of what he wrote said this, that the world may know the truth, I wish now standing as it were in the very sunset of life and in the fear of God once and for all to make this public statement that I have never at any time denied that testimony or any part thereof which has so long since been published as one of the three witnesses. Those who know me best will know that I have always adhered to that testimony and that no man may be misled to doubt my present views in regard to the same I do now again affirm all my statements as then made and published. All right, so David Whitmer. 
about nine months after Martin Harris was rebuked for losing uh, the pages of the Book of Mormon, the prophet Joseph Smith received a revelation declaring that there would be three witnesses to the plates, and if Martin would humble himself, he'd have that opportunity to be one of them. In August of 1870, a Utah interviewer sought out the 87-year-old Martin Harris. The reporter quoted Martin by saying the following, It is not a mere belief, but as a matter of knowledge. I saw the plates and the inscriptions thereon. I saw the angel, and he showed them unto me. I tell you of these things that you may tell others that what I have said is true, and I dare not deny it. I heard the voice of God command me to testify to the same. Well, the witnesses of the of the Book of Mormon, the three witnesses, have now been included in almost 150 million copies of the Book of Mormon since it was published in 1830. President Dallin Oaks uh, said, each of the three had ample reason and opportunity to renounce his testimony if it had been false. As is well known, because of disagreements or jealousies involving other leaders of the church, each one of these three witnesses was excommunicated from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints by about eight years after the publication of their testimonies. All three went their separate ways with no common interest to support a collusive effort. Yet to the end of their lives, which ranged between 12 and 50 years after their excommunication, not one of these witnesses deviated from his published testimony or said anything that would cast a shadow on its truthfulness. Like the Book of Mormon itself, there is no better explanation that is given than the solemn statement of good and honest men who told what they saw. And so there is some relevant information on the title page and the three witnesses. Certainly, it helps strengthen our testimonies as we see that others saw and witnessed uh, the plates and the engravings and the angel. Now, week two of our Come, Follow Me material asks us to start to read uh, from 1 Nephi chapters 1 through 5. And I have identified in that reading a somewhat unique feature that is found, and that's what I would like to highlight and share with you for the next few minutes. Bear with me, there's <clears throat> some considerable reading here, but for you to, uh, to feel the uh, importance of what I'm going to share with you, I need to, I need to review a few scriptures. In 1 Nephi, Nephi chapter 4, part of our reading material, verses 19 through 27, it says, And after I had smitten off his head with, my, with his own sword, I took the garment of Laban and put them on my own body, yea, even every whit, and I did gird on his armor about my loins. And after I had done this, I went forth into the treasury of Laban. And as I went forth towards the treasury of Laban, behold, I saw the servant of Laban, who had the keys of the treasury. And I commanded him in the voice of Laban that he should go with me into the treasury. And he supposed me to be his master, Laban, for he beheld the garments and also the sword girded about my loins. And he spake unto me concerning the elders of the Jews, he knowing that his master Laban had been out by night among them. And I spoke unto him as if it had been Laban. And I also spoke unto him that I should carry the engravings which were upon the plates of brass to my elder brethren who were without the walls. And I also bid him that he should follow me. And he, supposing that I spake of the brethren of the church, and that I was truly that Laban whom I had slain, wherefore he did follow me. And he spake unto me many times concerning the elders of the Jews, as I went forth unto my brethren who were without the walls. I find this incident really, really fascinating. And you know, this ability to be seen and heard as a different individual actually has a modern-day counterpart. On August the 8th, 1844, on the east bank of the Mississippi River, roughly about six weeks after the murder of the Prophet Joseph Smith, an event similar to Nephi's took place. 
Sidney Rigdon, who had served as first counselor in the first presidency of the church under Joseph, had returned to Nauvoo, Illinois from his self-imposed exile in Pittsburgh, and although a leader of the church for many years and having been a part of incredible, incredible revelations, such as Doctrine and Covenants section 76, Sidney's relationship with Joseph had been strained and actually had faded away. In fact, by 1843, Joseph has expressed his desire to release Sidney from the First Presidency, to cast him off. However, at a church general conference in October of 1843, Sidney Rigdon asked to remain in his position, and the congregation, contrary to the express wishes of Joseph, agreed to let him stay. Joseph said, I have thrown him off my shoulders, and you have again put him on me. You may carry him, but I will not. With Joseph now dead, Sidney had come back claiming his right to be the church's guardian or protector. Now, on a windy day, on August the 8th, 1844, the saints gathered in Nauvoo. They gathered at 10 o'clock in the morning to hear Sidney make his claim as the new church guardian. Because the wind was blowing towards the stand where the brethren were seated, Brother Rigdon took his position in a wagon behind the assembled congregation so the people could better hear his voice. The congregation turned around so that they could see Brother Rigdon as he preached. He spoke to thousands that were assembled that day. He spoke for an hour and a half explaining why he should be the guardian of the church or its protector. Many people described his speech as uninspiring. President Brigham Young and other church leaders came and sat on the stand opposite where Sidney Rigdon was speaking. The wind had began to die down by this point. Brigham Young then stood and said he would have preferred to come back to mourn for the prophet than have to appoint a new leader. The audience was startled and turned in their seats toward the stand. As he spoke, many church members saw Brigham Young's appearance and his voice changed to that of the prophet Joseph Smith. Apparently not only his voice, but his features, his stature, his gestures were all that of Joseph. It had even said that his voice was exactly that of Joseph, right down to the hissing S sound resulting from the broken tooth Joseph received when he was tarred and feathered in Hiram, Ohio. I'm going to share with you now a few memories or thoughts of those that were there on that windy day in August. Benjamin F. Johnson recalled, President Brigham Young arose and spoke. I saw him arise, but as soon as he spoke, I jumped upon my feet, for in every possible degree, it was Joseph's voice, his person, look, attitude, dress, and appearance. It was all Joseph personified. And I knew in a moment that the spirit and mantle of Joseph was upon him. President Wilford Woodruff wrote, if I had not seen him with my own eyes, there is no one that could have convinced me that it was not Joseph Smith, and anyone can testify to this who was acquainted with these two men. George Q. Cannon, who was 17 years old at the time of this conference, remembered, If Joseph had arisen from the dead and again spoken in their hearing, the effects could not have been more startling. It was the voice of Joseph himself, and not only was it the voice of Joseph which was heard, but it seemed in the eyes of the people as if it was the very person of Joseph which stood before them. The Lord gave his people a testimony that left no room for doubt as to who was the man chosen to lead them. Orson Hyde had an interesting comment. He said, as Brigham Young spoke, his words went through me like electricity. Am I mistaken, or is it really the voice of Joseph Smith? This is my testimony. It was not only the voice of Joseph, but there were the features, the gestures, and even the stature of Joseph there before us in the person of Brigham. And though it may be said that Brigham Young is a complete mimic and can mimic anyone, I would like to see the man who can mimic another in stature who was about four or five inches higher than himself. Wilford Woodruff said, 
Every man and every woman in the assembly, which perhaps might have numbered thousands, could bear the same testimony. I was there. The question might be asked, why was the appearance of Joseph Smith given to Brigham Young? Because here was Sidney Rigdon rising up and claiming to be the leader of the church. But just as quick as Brigham Young rose in that assembly, the face was that of Joseph Smith. The mantle of Joseph had fallen upon him. The power of God was upon Joseph that was upon Joseph was upon him. And had the voice of Joseph, and it was the voice of the shepherd, there was not a person in the assembly, but was satisfied in his own mind that Brigham Young was the proper leader of the people. There was a reason for this in the mind of God. It convinced the people. They saw and heard for themselves, and it was the power of God. Well, an assembly was held later that day, later that uh, afternoon, and the saints unanimously voted or sustained the 12 and the first presidency as the leadership of the church. So, as with Nephi and President Young, the Lord works in mysterious ways to accomplish his purposes. I want to thank you for joining me today. I hope you've found the concepts and ideas that we've discussed to be interesting and beneficial as you read in the first two weeks of January our assigned material. Next time we meet, we've been asked to read from Nephi's chapter 6 through chapter 15, and that'll be weeks 3 and 4. Thanks again, I, and I appreciate the opportunity to join with you as we study our Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm.